<laughs> hello, hello, hello. We had a little false start there, Joe and I did. Um, let me make sure. So, hi, right, everybody. I'm Dr. Garrett Smith, the nutrition detective around these here YouTube parts. And if you can tell, I'm already kind of flushing. I did my, I'm, I've been having my niacin flush this morning. So if I look a little pink, that's why. All sorts of good stuff. And there are a couple of things I wanted to cover. Well, for those of you who don't know me, you can find me on at nutritiondetective.com. You can find all of the social media links below. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel and, you know, hit the bell notification and all that stuff that everybody else says. Um, so you can get all of our announcements. Oh, hold on. You're hearing an echo, Joe. I have no idea. Oh, let me find it. I don't have another YouTube window open, so it's the echo shouldn't be on my end. Um, are other people hearing an echo? Oh, Joe fixed it. Okay, cool. So. Yeah, we're still, you know, we're not experts in this uh, live streaming thing, but we like to think we do all right, considering we're total noobs to it and we don't have, you know, shady money giving us professional, you know, preparation and all that stuff. We're just, I'm just a guy who figures stuff out and questions everything and looks for the truth. So yeah, doing the best I can to spread it here. So anyway, we're doing all subscriber Q&A today. So Put your questions in the chat, in the live chat. You need to be a channel subscriber to do that. And then I go through them in order from top to bottom. If you want your question bumped to the top of the list, that would be to do a super chat, which is a small donation to the channel. And that gets your question up to the top of the list. And I make sure to hit those. And if I ever miss one, please <laughs> let me know because I want to hit it. If I've missed one in the past, feel free to send it in. Um, to the email contact thing on our on nutritiondetective.com and I will hit it in the future. Um, we will have, I was thinking next week we're going to do, next week we'll cover lactoferrin and all of the research on what scientists have called a miracle molecule to help all sorts of health conditions. Um, wanted to let you guys know who are, this is important, listen closely. If you're a Love Your Liver member right now, so if you belong to the website, the private website at members.nutritiondetective.com. We have a special, the lactoferrin is available to love your liver members until this coming Monday. We had, we opened it up yesterday to love your liver members. And we had so many orders that Julie's just been packing up orders to send out. We're super happy. You guys are getting it. I was super happy to have it back. I, I feel better when I have it and I get so much more work done. It's as simple as that. I've, I've now experienced that twice when we've sold out so fast because you guys like it so much that I ran out twice and I got to notice. This is one thing I tell people about, is a supplement actually doing something for you or helping you or not? You can do two things. You can start taking it and see if something changes. And then if you're not sure, you can stop taking it and see if something changes for better or worse. A lot of you out there, myself, I've been this in the past. A lot of people are supplement junkies, total supplement junkies. Two, two terms I like, supplement junkies and the supplement graveyard. <laughs> the supplement graveyard, almost all of us who are into natural health have it. It's all those supplements that you've bought, you've tried, you didn't finish. Maybe you didn't feel good on it. Maybe you weren't sure. Maybe you bought it for something and it didn't work. And we just keep them around in the hopes that someday we'll use it again. Most of the time we never do, right? We just keep accumulating more and more of them. And one of the things we do in this program is we help you get rid of those because you won't ever use them. Most likely they'll expire. And oh, just so you know, um, yeah, supplements don't automatically expire. Just, they, the FDA often makes us put expiration dates on things, on things that would potentially... like. Can you believe that there's expiration dates on salt at the grocery store? When exactly does salt expire? It's been around a while, right? It's it's still going through the environment. Everybody, it's just recycling and it's it doesn't expire. Minerals don't expire. 
they don't go bad. They don't, they don't even necessarily lose their potency. Um, so anyway, expiration dates on supplements are, they actually say that when the expiration date hits, it's only, it's supposedly 90% as potent as when it was made. So it's lost 10% of its potency. That's it. But they make you put expiration dates on there. Like, like a 90% effective supplement wouldn't do something. Not that it's necessarily doing good things. If you're taking supplements that we talk about here that are toxic for you. So just be careful of that. But supplement addicts, supplement addiction is a huge thing. Many of us have been here. You might, you might have done this in the past. I know there was a point in my past where I worked in the supplement store where I was taking, I think it was about 50 pills a day. Just because I was reading all the BS. I worked in the health food store, so they had books there. And obviously I do a lot of research and I was taking stuff. It's like when people read the Life Extension magazine or all these other free email newsletters that everybody puts out and they sell every single supplement to the sun for every single condition. And you, and we, I read them and maybe you've read them in the past and you go, oh, I definitely need that either because you have the issue or because you want to avoid the issue. And then you often get on it and years later, you've been buying it for weeks and months and years and decades. And then when I get a hold of you in the program, I say, why are you taking it? And they go, uh, I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> if you don't remember why you're taking a supplement, you probably don't need it. If you took a supplement for an issue and it didn't help, stop taking it. <laughs> and if you feel bad on a supplement, stop taking it or take less. These are the basic things that we all should do, but a lot of people get into supplement addiction and they can't stop. I have, I've had people come to me on three page lists of supplement ingredients, three pages, like a spreadsheet, just, you know, one, one supplement per line, but spreadsheets of three pages long. One woman I helped with this, we got her down to one page on our first consult. They saved so much money between her and her husband on all these supplements. They took a vacation the month after that. Like, think of how much money you're wasting. People can be like, you know, we don't, we don't endorse coffee here, but you know, if you buy a $5 coffee every day, $5 something coffee every day at the end of a year, that's two grand that you spent on coffee. You could easily do way more than that in garbage supplements that aren't helping you. That may even actually be making you sicker and then making you want to buy more supplements. So just be very careful. So let's get into the chat. Let me find the chat. Here it is. Okay. So Joe, I didn't see any super chats. Um, oh, one other thing I just want to bring up right here at the beginning. I don't get into religious based debates in the live chat or in the comments. This is not the place for that. If you want to do that, there are plenty of forums on the internet. There are plenty of other YouTube channels that enjoy that. We are not here to use time. I'm not going to say waste time, but we're not here to use time on subjects like that. So just saying that we've had a little issue with that recently. The issue has been solved and this is not the place for it. There's certain places for things, and this is not the place for that. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Oh, <laughs> Finsk. Finsk brought up something. Yo, has everyone taken their fresh retinol dose today? So I, I want to address something. The disinformation campaigns against vitamin A toxicity are coming. First, we had, th this is, this is not a disinfo campaign in my opinion, but the idea that somehow natural vitamin A is different and absolved and avoid, uh, you know, it has no toxicity compared to synthetic vitamin A. I have a whole thread on Twitter. Well, actually, let me go find that thread. Um, I have a whole thread on Twitter showing that that is garbage. Joe, you don't have to show it yet. Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. 
here. So here's my Twitter thread. I'll post it in the in the chat um, of, oh, wait. Showing the research that natural forms of vitamin A and synthetic forms of vitamin A, when the exact same form is used and the exact same doses are used in animals and humans, they cause exactly the same amount of toxicity. Okay. Let me share it. So that there's that one, Joe, if you want to show them the screen, this is the, um, this is what the Twitter thread looks like. Yes. You do have to join Twitter. If you want to see my Twitter threads that I, I, even if you only subscribe to me, I'd say it's worth it because I this is where I put a lot of, I have a lot of muses on Twitter for better or worse to give me ideas about what to post about. Um, so there is that. Let me close that. Joe, you can go back to me. Um, let's see, show the screen. Is it the screen or is it the window? Let me show the window. Let me go in here. Hold on, let me fix this. Share screen window we want which one is it this one okay that should work okay so let's get back to it so that the so the next one that we often see the next disinfo campaign is what i call what what will originally called the egg cells these are folks who who believe in the the vitamin A is toxic idea, sort of. But for those of you who haven't heard, now they've upped the ante to six eggs a day. It used to be four eggs a day was the general recommendation. And now it's six eggs a day. Oh, well, let me go find my eggs thread. So they completely discount everything that I've presented in terms of... Where's the... There it is in terms of eggs. So let me find my eggs thread for you all if you want to read it. Folks, eggs are not an issue particularly because of the cholesterol they contain. Um, eggs are an issue, hold on, let me find it, because they, hold on, let me find this. Well, just the research on them, as the research on them is fairly clear that as people start consuming more than two a week, uh, certain conditions, also well, all sorts of conditions that we associate with chronic disease go up. Okay. Um, there it is. There it is, Joe, if you want to show it. Um, Go through this thread. Like, I don't even bring up cholesterol. And one of the things I do bring up in this thread is I bring up um, choline. And actually, choline is the major reason why people's blood choline... In ingesting choline from eggs is the major reason why people's blood choline goes up and down. And they actually showed that higher blood choline was associated with earlier death. Okay? So, go read the thread but now they're advocating six eggs a day it used to be four and fish cakes and all sorts of things it's just it's a disaster and this is in the facebook vitamin a toxicity group i don't want to show the link to it because i don't want anyone going and getting bad advice if you really want to find it you can go find it now the newest thing and no i'm not going to share the link to this i posted it in the love your liver program is anhydroretinol this is the newest garbage idea um, being proposed. And this is also, this person mentioned that if you want more info on this, you can go to the Facebook Vitamin A Toxicity Group. So this Facebook Vitamin A Toxicity Group is toxic. Um, they're trying to say that it's only this magical one form of retinol that due to quantum nutrition mechanics this is they seriously talk about quantum nutrition and if you don't get this is why fence's comment fence's fence's comment about fresh retinol they were trying to say that you need fresh retinol let me remind people retinol even if you believe in vitamin a being a vitamin retinol does nothing do you understand retinol there's no retinol receptors 
Retinol, if you believe that vitamin A is a vitamin, retinol turns into retinoic acid, and that is what's called active vitamin A. And so now this person who is a dietitian, which there's a funny pattern of dietitians doing whatever they think their approach is to the low vitamin A diet with themselves and their kids, and they seem to have a real problem with it. It's a real pattern. Maybe they think they know too much. And another thing about dietitians, especially, this is not meant, this is, this is a pattern, but there's a lot of issues with women who tend to under eat. And these have both been female dietitians, and I think they both just messed up their entire program because they didn't eat enough and they weren't giving their kids enough food. If you don't eat enough, you will go into starvation or pseudo starvation and things will fall apart. And where do they find vitamin A deficiency in the world? Supposedly in protein, energy, malnutrition countries. They're not getting enough protein and they're not getting enough calories. Can you do this to yourself? Sure. Just don't eat enough meat and don't eat enough food overall and things fall apart. And then these are the same people who think that they need vitamin A because they gave themselves a starvation problem. It's not, not enough fresh retinol. So anyway, this is, this is cruise level delusion and misdirection and desperation to find a reason that people can keep eating the foods that they want to eat. And if you haven't seen my research showing that vitamin A is addictive, you should, maybe I, maybe I should look that up. Actually, why don't I do that? So let me go into here. Let me go into Joe. You don't need to show it yet. Well, it's weird that vitamin A has been shown in the research to be addictive and people are trying to find any reason that they possibly can to keep eating it. And then they say they don't feel as good when they don't eat it. Talk to a, talk to an addict of anything and they feel worse when they don't eat it. And they want it back in their life and they say, oh, I feel better when I eat this. That's addictive behavior. Here we are right in here. So let me plug this into the chat. Okay. There it is. Let me see if we're showing it. So this is, this is from my old research forum. I posted the research here. There was, there, there was one paper. I don't know if I, rem, if I included it in this one, but there was one paper on a kid, a young, young, like infant, the mother poisoned with fish oil and butter and eggs and all like, I'm maybe not an infant, but like two years old, three years old. And then later, so the, the kid was vitamin A poisoned. The doctor said, don't give him any vitamin A foods because the mother did it. Gosh, sounds like Weston A. Price. carrots. This addict child was found sneaking carrots, even though they had blood diagnosis and all sorts of stuff that this kid was totally toxic in vitamin A. The kid wanted more. What happens to drug addicts as they get more of something? They want more of it. It's called tolerance. Two signs of drug addiction. Withdrawal symptoms. When people take it away, they feel worse. Tolerance. People need more to get the same effect as they become more damaged and more toxic. What are people doing on Twitter and all over the internet now? More and more vitamin A. Do you see the behaviors here? And then they justify it. Somehow they'll say that this thing that I'm addicted to has to be good because I'm addicted to it and I like it. I feel better with it. It's not like meat. Like I tell people, like, am I addicted to meat? I mean, I feel better on it, but if you took it away from me, I could, I could fast. I could not eat red meat for a while. I could not eat chicken. Would I want to eat it? Yeah. Would I feel better if I ate it? Yeah. Am I going to be like shaking and, you know, getting angry at people? 
Probably not because it's not an addiction. It's like better fuel for the engine. But anyway, the anhydro retinol thing, this is the new psyop. This almost feels like a plant, like somebody planted in the community to start putting out this gibberish garbage. Fresh retinol. Yeah, and, and then, then you're not supposed to have freeze-dried liver or cod liver oil because it's not fresh. I, I, it's just the garbage out there is just beyond. So anyway, let's keep going. Oh, Finsk, Finsk also said something funny right after that. He said, I'm planning to put out a new ultra-pure and fresh retinol supplement called Fresh A. It's derived from pristine, pure, fresh cod liver oil and freeze-dried to ensure it's fresh. It will be out in a month. Good luck with that, Finsk. <laughs> go, go sell that in the Facebook toxicity group. <clears throat> they would love it. Just tell them there's extra choline in it to, so they can absorb their vitamin, their fresh retinol and store it in their liver as efficiently as possible. And yes, that's all sarcasm. So let's keep going. Um, and Rustica, um, I, I want to let me say something just because this brings it up in my mind. Let's say anybody, this is not just, this is for anybody. If you were out there and maybe at the, at the start, anybody, and I'm not saying N Rustica did this, but if you were out at the start and let's say you came at me on social media kind of hard because you liked your vitamin A and you wanted to keep it. And maybe you said something that I didn't much care for and I blocked you. You are always welcome to come back and request to come back into the community. I do forgive. I don't forget, but I do forgive. And I will give people second chances because I realize that people may make bad decisions and may say things that they didn't realize the implications of. And they may not have realized that my social media, I don't take any ish on my social media. <laughs> so you can always come back and ask to get back in. I do that. I don't hold long-term grudges. I just don't put up with much. And I, I, one of the things I will not put up with is people promoting stuff. Now I'm not saying and Rustica did this, but anybody promoting ideas that I'm not in alignment with on my social media, because then folks, people can say all sorts of stuff on the internet. And if I allow it to exist on my social media, then people think that's somehow an endorsement. Now, people could say, well, you have to have discernment, but I'm going to help people to avoid having to discern that on my social media. Inside the, net, the Love Your Liver Network the other day, there was somebody trying to promote vitamin D3 rat poison supplements. Not going to happen. Somebody once came into the Love Your Liver Network talking about how iron overload causes everything. No. I don't even say vitamin A toxicity causes everything. It worsens everything. It doesn't cause everything. It's actually kind of a side effect, a downstream effect of damaging your liver, and then you can't get rid of the vitamin A, and then you accumulate it, whether it's fresh or stale. Oh, I see John Dickinson has arrived. That's good. Glad you're here, John. Um, oh, and we're just doing about two hours today, just so you know. So in case you're, in case you're looking for the five hours thing, it's not happening today. <laughs> um, oh, and Rustica says, I'm going to do a niacin, flush niacin today. It makes a sauna seem less hot. It is. So flush niacin, right? This is, we only talk about nicotinic acid here. We only talk about flush niacin. It's not an, it's not vitamin B3. It's an amino acid. It's a it's not a B vitamin. It's an amino acid. It comes from tryptophan. How many other B vitamins do they talk about being derived from an amino acid? And when you look at the doses that people can and do take, it's nothing in the realm of other vi B vitamins. So anyway. Oh, Brenda's saying the video image is backwards. No, Brenda, I uh, changed. I mirrored the screen. I mirrored the screen so that when I when I need to move myself back into the center because I'm kind of kind of mobile, um, so I don't have to like reverse 
my movement. <laughs> it's for my little brain while I'm live. Um, but yeah, the sauna thing, um, for those of you who aren't aware, flush niacin. Okay. This is very, very important. If you are out there and you are really toxic or really sensitive to things and you very easily get into dumping too much bile too quickly, if you get too much stimuli, heat, sweating, exercise, niacin, lactoferrin, if you get into too much bile dumping, well, if you go and you take, let's say, niacin, if you want to do the old uh, Scientology-based L. Ron Hubbard kind of thing, um, where, where it's basically this. Now, am I, do I endorse Scientology? No. Are broken clocks right twice a day? Yes. So we can take good ideas from other areas and utilize them. Okay. So the, the old... Uh, detox was basically this and this was used um the the gulf war uh kind of call it the gulf war detox there was veterans of the gulf war who were really messed up and really toxic and they went and they did this for i think it was eight weeks and they improved their quality of life almost like at least 33 percent in terms of their their scores on these questionnaires if not 50 percent. and it held for like six months after that it was crazy so all it was was flush niacin which is your energy to run detox systems, provides NAD to run your detox enzymes. So they took their flesh niacin. They would immediately go and do some cardio exercise. Now in the, in the study, it said moderate intensity. Now, if you're really sick, you may not want, you may not be able to do the cardio. Like walking too far might wreck you but you'll have all the personal trainers and all the tough guys on Twitter being like, you have to exercise. Maybe you're not ready for it yet. So don't, but anyway, it would be 20, 30 minutes of moderate cardio. If all you could do was walk during that time, fine. If all you did was like the arm cycle because doing your leg walking is too much, whatever. I personally am at the point where I will do the incline treadmill at the gym because after that you want to be at the, I want to be at the gym for this because that's where I then access the next stages. But so ni flush niacin will dump bile. So if you can hardly tolerate flush niacin by itself, are you going to be going and doing cardio after that? Probably not. You're going to kick your own ass. So. In the early stages of this, first, you're making sure that you can do the flush nice and that your dosing works for you and helps you feel better and not worse. And no, the flush does not mean you feel worse. The flush is the detox. Okay. So flush niacin, some 20 to 30 minutes of, they say moderate, I'm fine with mild. It's just to get the, the blood pumping and get some fat burning going. And then it would be the typical recommendation is an infrared sauna for however long you tolerate it. And it's typically what they would consider low temperature sauna. I think, I think the calculation was like 140 degrees to 180 Fahrenheit. Um, so anyway, the, that, and then they were doing in that Gulf war study, like, okay, do you have a life? Cause I do in that Gulf war study. They were talking like two to three hours of low temperature infrared sauna. Do I have the time for that? No, I got kids. I help take care of my mom. I got a business. I want to work out. Like, no, I don't have two to three hours. So I might do anywhere from, well, where I go, I go and I drink my flush nice in the parking lot of the gym. I walk in. I get on the incline treadmill. I do it at the pace I choose to do it at for about 20 minutes. Boring as all get out watching the normies in the gym. I mean, it's, it, it is like a clown show these days. And then I go and I, uh, change into my swim trunks and then they have a steam room there. I go and I do that for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then I go and I do the infrared sauna for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That's my typical approach. Some days if I have enough time and the, and the sunlight is still out, I will then shower. You need to, you want to shower after all that. 
get all that nasty toxin filled sweat off of you. And then sometimes I'll do the, the tanning bed they have there for like five minutes. Cause you already just washed all this crap out of the skin. Why not just break more of it down? Even though we just, we just pumped a bunch of it out of the skin. The flush is long over by this time. So anyway, if you decide to go and undertake this and you jump in with what I'm doing and not realize that I've been doing this detox stuff for over five and a half years now, and let's say you're into this for three months and you're like, oh, I'm going to go do exactly what Dr. Smith does. And you wreck yourself for a couple days after that. You're not following the, the guidelines, the protocols, the whatever you want to call it. We don't really do protocols. That's you didn't follow what I say to do, which is start slow, add one thing at a time. It's very simple. Um, oh, so yeah, Joe post here. Let me post this. Joe, uh, posted where I talk about in a live stream, uh, how vitamin A causes addiction. So if you would rather watch it, Watch me talk about, hear me talk about it, watch me talk about it. Then that that's, I just posted that video in the chat. It is the one about sailors diets and vitamin A toxicity causing scurvy, being the cause of scurvy and also how vitamin A worsens addictions. And we do see a lot of times as people get less toxic, they quit all these things that are bad for them so much easier. And we call that poisons beget poisons, which is where people it's number 92 live stream number 92. But poisons beget poisons, which basically means the more poisons you're putting in to your body, the more you want poisons, which is funny for the egg cells, right? <laughs> they're, they're probably trying to, I, I think uh, they also don't think the polyphenol thing is a problem either. Poisons beget poisons. The more poisoned your brain is, the more you want poisons. The less poisoned your brain is, the less poisons you want. We see it all the time. Now, there's still the mental part of it. Like if you're just convinced you need to treat yourself to these things, yeah, you can't. There's still the mental part of it, but the biochemical part is not dragging you into it as much. Okay. So, yeah, that was a little divergence into the flush niacin cardio infrared so, I mean, I, I have, I have a membership to this other gym. I think it costs me $33 a month and I get access to do the cardio and walk over and then do the steam room and then walk across the hallway and go do the infrared sauna. And then if I choose to, I can do the tanning bed. So for 33 bucks a month, am I going to buy all those things and put them in my house? <laughs> Maybe someday. Maybe if I ever have a retreat, I'll have all that stuff around and I can just do it whenever I want. But until then. That is, that is the one reason I go to a normie. Well, the multiple reasons I pay that each month to go to a normie gym. So I can do that. So anyway, there's that. Okay. Was there any super chats, Joe? I didn't see any yet. There's okay. There's Ramon, Ramon, the normal super chat guy uh, The every time he's the regular. Hello, Ramon. Um, we have Okay. Hi, Dr. Smith. How would you naturally treat a congestion slash sinusitis? What would you do or not do to try to prevent both from happening in the future? Okay. Hold on. Let me, on that note, let me blow my nose real quick. Some people, including my dad and my son, Genetically, probably they like to detox through their sinuses. Not everybody has this. Other people detox other places. And if you tend to have problems in other places, that may be the way you detox. Like if somebody told me they always had a ton of earwax and a bunch of tinnitus, they probably detox through their ears. If somebody told me they have yellow spots, yellow armpits on their shirts, and they have a lot of body odor problems, they probably detox through their armpits. Okay, do you see, the, do you follow me? I, we've had people on the vitamin A detox who say as they start the detox, they actually say they turned their white sheets on their bed yellow where they slept. This poison wants out of you. It's gonna come out 
the ways that it can. Um, okay, so let's go over some of the, the healthier things that you can do to help with congestion or sinusitis. So one of the things that we do a lot in the program is, well, first of all, getting rid of, so, so chronic sinusitis can be fungal in nature. So you could have fungus growing up there. Anytime it's stagnant or you got too much goo blocking up things, things start growing. So one of the things, well, multiple things that we do on the program, obviously, other than we stop feeding it with vitamin A, but we do actually have research on nicotinic acid, flush niacin, helping with candida related issues. Zinc is antifungal. Selenium is antifungal and molybdenum is antifungal. So we start correcting those deficiencies so that then fungus doesn't want to grow there. It's not able to grow there. Fungus, uh, do, do spores to fungus exist? So for all the terrain people, everything's terrain and germ theory has no value. Well, okay, if you don't think spores from like fungus exist, I'm pretty sure they do. But spores can only thrive and grow in the right environment. You understand? It's like, do I think parasites exist? Yes, parasites can only thrive and grow in the right environment. That's why everybody's not running around with parasites. That's why all the dogs everywhere don't all have parasites. That's why all the humans aren't all running around with yeast infections and prostatitis. Prostatitis, if you didn't know, is the male version of a candida infection in women, like a, a yeast infection in women. So we fix the soil so that the spores and the parasites don't grow, and if they are there, they fade away and fall off because the environment's not suitable anymore. So one of the first things that we would do is would be to, I mean, we want less toxicity, which is the things we work on in the program, and then we would make sure that those nutrients, especially those, those ones I just mentioned, are being addressed, and we do talk about all those in the program. So there's that. Then you could get into if you wanted to help the process along. You can get any any one of those sinus rinse doohickeys. We'll use a fancy term there. You could get a Neil Med sinus rinse, the one where it's just the squeezy bottle. Okay, neti pots. <sighs> neti pots are such weak, old tech, if you want to use that word. Pouring it, depending upon the water, where you got to crank your neck back and get it all in the right angle. I, no. Once I learned about a Neil Med, which is just, I mean, yes, it's plastic. Okay, it's squeezable plastic, so you can squeeze it up your nose. You're putting water in there. It's in there for like two minutes, not even a minute maybe, maybe 30 seconds. You mix it with the little packet of salt and baking soda that they give you, or you can put in your own. You can figure out how much to put in on your own, and you rinse one nostril out. You, 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 you can stay straight up over the sink, Put it in one nostril, squeeze it, wash it out. And then you do the other nostril with the other half of the water. That's it. Now, let's say this is just in theory. Let's say somebody made something up like chlorine dioxide. Those three letters, M and M and S, and they, they put some of that couple drops maybe in a Neil Med or in any you know, of those other sinus rinse things. And they rinsed their nose, their sinus passages, maybe like, oh, I don't know, twice a day. And then they're actively going up in there, putting oxidizing agents up into their nose to oxidize stuff that grows in areas where there's not a lot of oxygen. I have done this myself with um, the part one because there's two parts to the chlorine and dioxide formula. Sometimes I'll just put part one in a Neil Med and rinse out my nostrils with it. So there, those, there's those things. Now I will just type it out here. Actually, let me find, I'll find the, the Amazon page. One of the times... 
I do think a small investment in trying some homeopathics without having to go to a homeopath um, can be helpful. Let me just find the page. Wait, stop zooming in. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'll put it down in here. So there's this Progena Allergena. Progena is the company. Allergena is their line. Joe, you can show this if you want. Um, Progena Allergena. These are what the products look like. Um, they have ones for different zones of the country. All the different allergenic type plants are in there. They got special ones for Texas. They've got these different zones. Like zone two is the Southeast of the U S Texas cedar fever. They got all sorts of stuff. These are like 30 bucks a bottle, totally worth trying when they work, they work. If they don't work, you're out 30 bucks. How much money have, have we all wasted on stupid health stuff that didn't work? Way more than 30 bucks. You can go to one treatment of whatever therapy you want. It's going to be like two or three or four times as much as a bottle of Allergena. And if the Allergena works, it's going to work a long time. I mean, it'll just, it'll just keep working. Now, the goal is to get rid of this. So if we're talking allergy congestion, um, then it's just going to be until you're less toxic because it is the vitamin A toxicity and potentially the nicotinic acid deficiency that is driving. If you haven't seen the anaphylaxis show, which is the worst form of allergies, allergies you could have, you should go watch the anaphylaxis show. That was, I don't know, three or four episodes ago. So go check that out. Um, yeah. And then, so then if you get into like, well, the other thing is we're talking about, let's talk about pollen and animal dander. Let's say you think you're sensitive to those. Well, what color is pollen? It's typically yellowish or orangish, right? What color is vitamin A again? Oh, it's typically yellowish or orangish. So if you were breathing in, pollen that is full of vitamin A and it's getting stuck in your nostrils and your sinuses. Gosh, do you think you could have a toxicity reaction to that? Like you were going to run, your nose is running, trying to wash it out. You're sneezing, trying to blow it out. You're coughing, trying to cough it out. Your body's just simply trying to get rid of poison. So then what you could do in your house is you could definitely find a really good air filter you do want to have EMF protection on your air filter. If you have anything that runs all day, like with a motor, you want to have the EMF protection on it. You could see the EMF episode where I talk about those products. Um, Joe, if you want to put that link up, that would be fine. But you definitely want an EMF thing on the cord of a fan. Any kind of fan that runs all day, you definitely want an EMF thing on that. Because any kind of motor puts out a, a lot of EMF. I have an air filter in my room. And I have the EMF protector on it. Um, so that's how you could pull stuff out of the air. Now, cat and cat dander, dog dander. We have tons of people in the Love Your Liver program. So there's the anaphylaxis episode that Joe just put up. Cat dander, dog dander. That's that's their skin. You know, we lose our, you know, we peel, we, we shed skin all the time. Most of the dust in your house, what is it? Something like 90% of the dust in your house is like skin flakes from you and your animals. Okay. It sound, it's kind of gross, but that's just the way it is. You're constantly shedding skin. So dogs and cats are shedding it too. And we have tons of people in the love your liver program who are finding that their animals are benefiting a ton from being on a very low vitamin A diet as well. You, you remember how people can get so toxic in vitamin A that they turn orange or yellow, right? Can you see your cat or dog's skin very well under there to even notice if it was turning yellowish or um, orangish? No, not really. But could those animals be depositing a lot of vitamin A in that skin that they are shedding and now you're breathing it in the air and you're having an allergic reaction 
to the skin that is full of vitamin A. So are you starting to see how a lot of allergies, and, and the funny thing is, so Joe just put up the link to the EMF show down there. That's a really good show. In my opinion, you should definitely watch that. Um, be careful though. This, 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 uh, YouTube channel can induce binge watch binge watching. So it, it's been noted before. Um, but yeah. Oh, and also for those of you who have ever taken food allergy tests, Go in now with what you know about vitamin A toxicity, go and review your food allergy tests and see just how many of the foods that showed up on there are high in vitamin A. And then you may start seeing a pattern, a definite pattern. So, and I've shown the research here before about how the more vitamin A that children are exposed to, the more allergic diseases they show and the more vitamin A that adults were even exposed to as children, the more asthma they have as adults. It's all connected. So now if you, if somebody wanted to shut down, if you were just like, look, my allergies are horrible. I want to shut it down. I don't care what I have to do. I don't care if I kind of slow the detox process or stop the detox process for a while because I want to shut down these allergies. That would be high dose ascorbic acid or high dose sodium ascorbate, basically high dose vitamin C because it's such an antioxidant will shut down your oxidative detox processes. It will slow down your bile production. This will give you some relief as long as you tolerate the vitamin C. Am I endorsing this? This is a band aid or a crutch. You can do it. The nice thing about vitamin C is it seems to wash out of your system quite quickly when you stop it and doesn't seem to cause permanent damage, except for the high dose vitamin C. If you take it for months to years, you do have a higher risk of fatty liver because you've stopped the detox for so long. So if you use it as a band-aid or a crutch, it's a temporary thing. Let's say you get out of the allergy season, stop taking it, stop doing that to yourself. The Band-Aid is not necessary anymore. The crutch that you can, you took off the cast, the aller, the, you know, the allergen is gone, so you can throw away the crutches, okay? So so that's that's the Band-Aid crutch. Like, you don't, you're okay. You just want this symptom to go away for a while. You need a break. But you understand that you are slowing down detox or maybe stopping detox completely for a period of time. And you have plans on putting less toxins in and getting the nutrients you need to fix this so that when you stop it, you're not further back. Because if you stop detox or you slow down detox and you're still putting toxins in, guess what? You're getting more toxic faster. So that's what it, that's what it is. Okay. So let's keep going. Joe, is there any more, uh, is there any more super chats? I didn't see any. No, there we go. Okay, Carol. Let me just see if there's anything else. Okay, so yeah, we got a couple. Thank you for the super chat, uh, Ramon. And thank you for the super chat, Carol. What do I recommend to cure eye infections? Okay. Well, I have to be careful with what I say here. I don't cure anything. The body cures things. We simply provide it the nutrition it needs and we help stop putting the poisons in that are causing the problem and we facilitate the removal of stored toxins and then the body does the healing. I personally have a thing against anyone calling themselves a healer. As, as soon as I hear somebody call themselves a healer, I call snake oil and God complex and I don't, I will not go to that person. I will not even discuss anything with that person because they want it to be all about them and not about the body doing the healing. The body does the healing. I'm more like a guide. And I've said this many times before. I'm not a guru. I'm not whatever. I am a guide giving people the tools that they can use to help themselves allow their body to do the healing. So yeah, we don't use the C word here. Um, 
yeah, we we even turned off all the ads. If you ever see ads on any of the any of any videos on my channel, uh, I've turned everything off because we're not trying to, you know, profit from this free work that we're giving away here. I love when people are like, "Why don't you give everything away for free?" And I'm like, "Cuz I like food on my table and a roof over my head." It's kind of this environment we live in that I got to function within. Like, I don't understand people who don't understand that. <laughs> So anyway, Carol, thank you for the super chat. Eye infections, actually. Um, so one of the things I believe in the Love Your Liver Network, Kelsey, Kelsey Kenny did write a um, isotonic drops recipe for um, something that could be used for eye drops. There is, um, I have personally, whether you choose to do this or not is up to you. I have personally used, um, you know, 10 part per million colloidal silver in, in directly in my eyes. It's not isotonic. It does sting just a little bit, but it does work. I can handle a little bit of sting to have it work. So nicotinic acid, as in those eye drops could work. Uh, colloidal silver, 10 parts per million. I use, I, the two, I, I would highly suggest getting a colloidal silver maker just to have it around your house. Um, I use one from thesilveredge.com and there's another one, silvergen, silvergen.com. Both of those are decent. No, I do not have the time or the inclination to go and look at a bunch of other colloidal silver makers. Those are the two that I know I like. So if you decide to go out and go buying different things and then you come back and you're like, well, this one sucked. And I'm like, oh, that's not the one I suggested. <laughs> so anything with eyes, whenever I hear eyes, um, first of all, it is very, probably eye infections can, they could be associated with an excess of tear production, but more likely they're associated with lack of tear production. Um, a lack of fluid production, whether it's a lack of like dry mouth, like a lack of saliva, a lack of eye fluid. Um, these are commonly associated with like medications. One of the most common symptoms of medications is a dry mouth. Um, but dry eyes are super common among vitamin A toxicity, like especially Accutane users. So one of the things that we can do for this, whenever I hear I anything, I think zinc deficiency and vitamin A toxicity, but we need zinc to get rid of vitamin A. So whenever I hear eye problems, zinc deficiency, potentially protein deficiency, overall protein deficiency. And for some people, taurine supplementation or just more red meat can help with that. So the funny thing is, is all these third world countries where they hardly eat any meat and they'll say, oh, they have vitamin A deficiency and, and they have all these eye problems and whatever. Well, in an under a third world country, they're not eating meat. So what are they not getting enough of? Zinc and protein and taurine. Taurine is really only found in appreciable amounts in red meat. There's a tiny bit in poultry, but like there's 10 times more in red meat. So those are the nutritional things I would tend to think of. Um, now, one other thing that you, you got to just start slowly with is, so lactoferrin in the body is in every single fluid of the human body. It's in tears, it's in saliva, it's in sweat, it's in semen, it's in everything. It's in urine, it, blood, everywhere. So if you were lacking fluids in an area, lactoferrin systemically, or even there are, ugh, I've thought about making lactoferrin eye drops, before, but I'm pretty sure for anything eye drops, like the pharmaceutical comp the pharmaceutical cartel, let me say that pr properly. The pharmaceutical cartel has such a stranglehold on the industry and the FDA that they make you put poisons into eye drops as preservatives and all of that stuff. Of course, do we want it? Do we want some sort of preservative? Sure. Do we want toxic preservatives? No, but of course, what is the government and industry trying to do to us, they're trying to poison us. So they'll make you put a poisonous preservative in it to, to, to ruin it. Kind of like 
with flush niacin that they used for cholesterol, they did a time release version so people wouldn't flush and the actual time release ingredients are super toxic. So whenever you see flush niacin and they're trying to say it's toxic, it's because of the time release in it. It's not the niacin. So yeah, zinc, protein, taurine, potentially taurine is a try it and see. Uh, some people, the, the research shows that up to 3000 milligrams of taurine in a day is safe long-term, but taurine may make you feel better. It may make you feel worse. So you just don't, don't go by, I'm going to take three grams a day. Just slowly go up maybe 500 milligrams at a time and see how it goes. And if you don't feel good on it, stop taking it. It's not what you need, but more meat, potentially a zinc supplement. There's like our liquid zinc picolinate. So you can dose it very carefully. It's only two milligrams a drop. Kelsey has some zinc nicotinate, which is zinc and niacin in her store. Um, over at Joe, do you have that link? Terranian treasures on Etsy. I can find it too. Um, or Kelsey, if you're in the chat, you're welcome to post it. That's what I've been. I've been, I've been experimenting with Kelsey's zinc nicotinate for a while now. That's actually in here. I've got niacin. So, so nicotinic acid and the zinc nicotinate in here and the, the nicotinic acid mixed with the magnesium carbonate that's in here buffers the niacin. And then I get to take magnesium nicotinate. Oh yeah. There's let me, let me go find it. Joe, I'll find, I'll find her store link. Let me find it. No big deal. It'll come right up. There we go. So if anybody wants to go check out Kelsey's store, Kelsey makes a lot of cool stuff and she is very much in alignment with, um, the love your liver. And if you don't like anything that she has in her store, here's a magical thing that you can do as a capitalist. You don't have to buy it. Okay. It's amazing. Don't be one of these people, folks, who for you to get something, you know, for you to interact with a person, for you to potentially get something good out of the person and share benefits, they don't have to be in alignment with you on every single thing ever. I don't understand where people got that idea that like everybody has to align on everything or else anyone who doesn't align is bad. Don't do that. So anyway, thank you for the super chat, Carol. I, I hope that helps. Um, there may even be with what, with that chlorine compound I talked about earlier, you may even want to look up stuff on the internet about how to do that. What kind of concentrations you could make about that. Um, maybe even look at MMS testimonials. .co, another website, and you might go here and type in eye infection in the search engine. So if you found anything on that and it helped, please let us know. So let me go back to this. Okay. Let's see. There was one more. Oh, Mer okay. Mariama Berry. I hope I'm saying your name right. But anyway, is palm oil toxic? I am West African. Will that explain my obesity and tingling in my fingers? How to detox the palm oil? I just found you. Thank you. I love your magnesium lotion. Well, thank you for the endorsement on the magnesium lotion. Funny thing. And no, she was not planted to say that. I'm going to. So the magnesium lotion is selling really well. We were getting close to running out of it. Why are, so some people might wonder why you run out of lactoferrin? Well, because supply chain issues, some of you may have noticed supply chain issues are starting to show up in the stores again. Hmm. Hmm. Wonder what they're trying to do there. Cause it supply chain issues are totally, I think mostly engineered. Um, it's a plan anyway. I've definitely noticed it. I went to Trader Joe's the other day and they were, they were like running out of things. The pasta they had, they were like, oh, all of our pasta is like running out. I was like, interesting. So
Is palm oil toxic? Red palm oil, absolutely toxic. Yes. Red palm oil. Super high in vitamin A and carotenoids and super high in toxic vitamin E, tocopherols, and tocotrienols. So yes, you don't want to use that. Now, in terms of detoxing from the 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 red palm oil, we had we actually we had one woman, one woman in the Love Your Liver program. I won't say her name. She's been with me for years. Before she was with me before the vitamin A thing. She came to me. She she actually ate. She had she had red palm oil left around after she bought it for something. And she started eating a bunch of it because she was trying to get rid of it. She was trying to use it up and she turned orange. So that's by definition, if, if you or anyone, you know, has ever turned yellow or orange from foods or supplements, you're by definition, vitamin A toxic. If you're not orange anymore or yellow anymore, what that means is that depending upon your stage of detox, if you're still, if you're, if you stopped eating vitamin A and your skin slowly stopped, you're slowly returned to normal color. What that means, it doesn't mean all that vitamin A is gone. It means the vitamin A has moved from your skin to your liver. Your body broke it apart from a retinyl ester or from the carotenoids. It broke it apart, got it out of the skin and moved it to the liver. It doesn't mean it's gone. If, and, and if you have never, minimized or reduced your vitamin A, you're probably still quite toxic, but at least, at least it's not in your skin anymore. It's on the next stage because the vitamin A toxicity has to move from your skin to your liver before it can get out through your bile. But just because you moved it from your skin to your liver, doesn't mean it left. At least not yet. We're working on it. <laughs> so, um, Obesity, uh, Miriam, I, or Miriam, I have a whole video on this channel about obesity. Um, you may want to check that out. There's, there's a bunch of different causes, but the liver being the toxic bile, cholestasis, all that stuff, copper toxicity, vitamin A toxicity, nutrient deficiencies, all of it's connected. As you, the longer you avoid eating the red palm oil, the longer, you know, the, the, the better things will get, you know, so Definitely, if you're if you're going to eat an oil for anybody out there, if you're going to eat an oil, first of all, we talk about reducing added fats in general or eliminating added fats. Like, do we actually think humans can't survive without added fats or oils? That's silly, right? We don't need man processed, you know, not synthesized, but engin engineered. Like they they are they're juicing foods. I love it how people be like, juicing is terrible. It's too high in sugar. And then they like juice foods to get oil out of them. And then they're like, no, this is amazing. We need so much fat. It's no, they're doing the same thing. They're juicing nuts and that's how they make nut milk. They're juicing things and making oil. They're juicing things and making sugar water. So anyway, I would just, how to detox the palm oil is, well, that's, that's the love your liver program. That's the whole thing that we do at members.nutritiondetective.com. It's not just, there is not just one thing. People tend to want to think that this approach is just simplistic and they just like, can you just avoid certain, can you do Grant Genru's prison diet as he jokes? You can do beef or bison. You could do black beans. You could do white and brown rice. You could do that. Do I think there's a faster way and a better way? Yes. Apparently Grant has mentioned now that he wishes he would have taken more charcoal along the way. Who's been talking about charcoal the whole time? I have. Charcoal soaks up toxic bile and everything that's in it, which includes copper and vitamin A and all that stuff. So I would definitely put the magnesium lotion on the areas that you have issues with for sure. Um, and then there's just the, the, Another way to detox the palm oil, one of the things that niacin does is it frees up toxic fat so that it can go to the liver so then the liver can do its job on it. But th these are just all things that are in the program. So I would, I would watch that obesity episode, work on those things, join the Love Your Liver program, start working on those things, and then just don't eat red palm oil ever again. If you were going to eat palm oil, 
get it naturally refined. I'm not suggesting that you eat it, but if, if you were going to eat it, if you're going to eat oils, get them naturally refined. If it doesn't say naturally refined or you contact the company and they don't say it's naturally refined, it's not what you want. And then getting them organic would be important. Don't eat yellow oils. What makes them yellow? Fat soluble toxins. Don't eat orange oils. Don't eat red oils. Simple as that. Okay. And then you do all the other things in the program and you reduce your overall vitamin A intake as well. So, um, oh yeah, here we go. Anna, Annaline Brits. She just added something after Mariama's post, but thank you very much for the super chat, Mariama. Thank you. Um, from, and she says she's from South Africa and it is true. We are all heavily vitamin A toxic over here due to everything being fortified by law, struggling with small fiber, polyneuropathy and severe food allergies. There was, there was a paper on this about South Africa. They were talking about, they were, they, the kids were getting, they're like eating a lot of liver. They were, they were taking supplements and they were fortifying the food like South Africa. They're really trying to just exterminate over there. So let me find, let me see. Was there another super chat yet? Oh, there we go. Two of them. Okay. And Rustica says, I want to support your channel because you are generous with any new information you have. Can you list remedies to try for women's yeast infection? Is their partner responsible for infecting her? So we kind of talked about this before. Um, first of all, this, this is very much like this, a similar things to what we were talking about, about the sinusitis and how it could potentially be fungal or yeast based. So all women and even men, we all have candida in us. We all have yeast and candida can switch from a yeast to a fungus, whatever that means in terms of all of this. But okay. Remember things can't grow if the soil won't support it. So if let's say a, a man and a woman were continually passing an infection back and forth, well, let's say they live together and they eat generally the same foods. They're exposed to generally the same toxins. They're potentially exposed to generally the same stressors. They're exposed to so many things that are similar. So would their internal terrain be similar enough to support an infection that they're like volleying back and forth? Sure. Absolutely. So could it be the man passing it to the woman? Sure. Could the woman be passing it to the man and the man, you know, we men in terms of fungal or yeast infections, like I said, it's prostatitis. You may not always notice it's going on. You may have minor symptoms and you're just like, I don't even, I just, I just have a little trouble peeing or, or whatever. So the, the remedies we, I, so this is an important concept. I don't have remedies or protocols for specific conditions. That's just not how this works. Now we will be talking about again. Zinc is antifungal. Are tons of women deficient in zinc and copper toxic at the same time and vitamin A toxic? Sure. So how do we fight those two toxicities? The best? Zinc. Selenium is antifungal. Selenium is also anti-copper. Okay. Molybdenum is anti-copper. Molybdenum is antifungal. These deficiencies are epidemic. I see them all the time. I fix them all the time. And then people see their fungal issues over time often go away. So that that's, and then we would stop feeding the, the, the yeast fungus, whatever it's growing because the soil is toxic and deficient. You should be growing other things there. Good things, not bad things. So if bad things are growing, it means there's there's an environment that is allowing this to happen. So we want to change the environment. Um, now, if you wanted to look into various, some, some people might get into doing, let's say, douches or washes. I'm not saying buy the ones that, at the drugstore or the chemist. 
I'm saying some people might get into doing something like maybe a, a nicotinic acid wash. Um, or they might get into doing something with, oh, I don't know, a chlorine compound that we've mentioned a couple times here. They might get into, you know, doing, but you want to change the, the soil. Like, think about it. If you go and you weed a garden by hand, or let's say you just run a lawnmower over all the weeds, are the same weeds going to come back? Yeah, you can go and like, you could wash out the vaginal canal and destroy everything there with natural things or synthetic things. Even worse would be like to take antibiotics and poison the whole system just to try to hit an area down there. Can you do that? Sure. Do you fix the problem? No. You've simply just eradicated the problem, but you have not changed the soil or the, the basis of the garden. So that is what we are trying to do. Um, yeah. That's, that's the big thing. Like, okay. So as an example, let me give an example here about fungus and, and the garden and the soil. I was actually going to post this on Twitter. I just didn't know how to say it. So as a child, uh, generally in my early life, I was very, very susceptible to skin funguses. I went to basketball camp here at the university and they would always say, you know, wear flip-flops in the shower so you don't get athlete's foot. And I didn't have like the flip-flops at the time. I didn't remember it. And I was kind of just like, I'll just go in the shower. I don't need stupid flip-flops. And I got athlete's foot like three separate times from that camp. Call me whatever you want for not wearing the flip-flops, but I was susceptible. I was toxic and deficient. I also had tinea versicolor. I've talked about that here. Tinea versicolor is a little skin fungus that on your tan areas, it will look pale because you can't tan in those areas. And on your pale areas, like the inside of your arm, it will look red. And it will be slight little patches of dry-ish skin. I used to have it under my under my pecs. I'd have it on my elbows and the inside of my arms. I'm trying to remember if I had anywhere else. I don't think so. So I've had multiple fungal issues in, and that was I think I had that until I was like in my mid twenties. I had I got it as like a teenager, and I had it probably until I was in my mid twenties, maybe early thirties. And uh, the I tried to use ketoconazole for the tinea versicolor. It killed it once. Ketoconazole is well known to damage the liver. And it's also known to reduce testosterone in men. Go look up ketoconazole and testosterone. And then on my athlete's foot, I used myconazole or mycotin, which is what they sell it as, the spray. Both of those things slow down your detox. They slow down ALDH. They slow down aldehyde dehydrogenase. This is in the literature. And they destroy testosterone production, which is probably related to how they mess up the liver and cause toxic bile leakage and then cause more health problems. So nowadays, now that I have fixed these issues, so I used to be susceptible. I got rid of the tinea versicolor by correcting my selenium deficiency. I've been over that before. I actually kind of high dosed for a couple months and I got rid of it. Okay. The athlete's foot I got rid of as a kid, but I'll be honest, some people may not like that I'm doing this, but I will, when I, when I go to the, the normie gym and I'm doing all that stuff, I don't wear flip-flops around the locker room. I just don't, I'm not going to bring a special pair of flip-flops to walk around to prevent my, to, to protect myself from these fungus spores that cannot get a hold in my body. I don't, I have not got athlete's foot at all. Why? Because I don't, the soil doesn't support it. The soil rejects the spores. So this is the difference. We must change the environment 
the soil so that if you want things to grow right in your soil, you got to have the right soil. If you don't want the wrong things to grow in your soil, number one, you want the right soil. But number two, you also want your cleanup crew, your weeding crew, your immune system. Think of your immune system as a cleanup crew rather than like a military. Okay. As you clean up the poisons, then you see improvement because you're not supporting the toxic soil. Okay. So that's, that's what I got. Now, could, could you be, could, could the man be changing the environment of let, let's say a man and a woman have sex and let's say they're, you know, could the man leave something behind in the woman that could change her internal environment, her soil. Sure. But then you'd ask yourself, why doesn't this problem happen to every woman? Why is their soil resistant to that? And then we start, we're back to the same thing. So can you have a trick, just like the spores, are there spores in the men's locker room for athletes? But probably but where do they grow? They're only going to grow on some people. Some people do the band-aid or the crutch and they wear the shoes to avoid them because they are susceptible, whether they know it or not. I am not susceptible anymore. So I don't have to worry about it. So there's that. Okay. Hope that helps. Um, you, you could get into colloidal silver, but what I've seen in people who only use colloidal silver to kill things to kill. Actually, colloidal silver is an oxidizing agent. That's how it works. Just like chlorine compounds, they are oxidizing agents. The, the thing I don't like about too much colloidal silver for too long is it does seem to accumulate in your cells over time, which may not be a terrible thing in terms of you've got silver stuck in your cells now. So it's going to be there doing its job, whatever it is. The problem is you could potentially, if you overdid it for way too long and way too high a doses, you could start to turn grayish or even blueish. Now, at some point, you should notice that you're changing color and stop. <laughs> like that blue guy, the guy who turned himself completely blue was either mental or he was paid to do that so they could scare everybody away from silver. That's my opinion on that. That's, that's like a psyop, but I have heard about other people. People have told me, Oh, I know this guy. I know this guy at a farmer's market. He's gray. He's grayish. I'm like, yeah, he overdid it. Now what they found worst case scenario, they've actually found that if you do tattoo removal, like the laser tattoo removal, you can, you can oxidize or you can break up that silver in the skin and get it back to normal color. So you can't escape <laughs> if you ever overdo silver. But um, chlorine, your you know chlorine compounds, your body can eliminate those. We have normal pathways for eliminating those. Okay. Um, Taylor asks. So Taylor, thank you for the super chat. Uh, hey Garrett, wondering about your sauna suggestions, if any. Oral charcoal, sixty minutes before. Nicotinic acid, thirty minutes before. Thanks for your work, big fan. Well, we don't really have. I. There is no data that I can go on as far as I know on this topic. Definitely not charcoal. I mean, charcoal is, you would have to, so in terms of sauna stuff, generally heat, I've talked about this before already in this, in this live stream, heat and sweating seem to increase bile dumping. Okay. So we know that that's going to happen. How to time, when, when does a person, when does this bile dumping, this big bile dump happen in relationship to the heat and the sweating? Like if I go to the gym and I drop my niacin in the parking lot, you know, I drink my flush niacin drink and I go right in and I'm doing the cardio and then I go and I do either the steam room or the sauna or both or one of the two. When does the big bile dump happen? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if taking the charcoal before I do all that, if, if I was taking charcoal before all that, sometimes I wonder if that's too early and it 
goes through the, and I, I have, I have very well moving bowels. Like my bowels are not slow. We'll put it that way. I think I've already been through that twice this morning. We'll put it that way. So I don't have slow moving bowels for people who have slow moving bowels. Who knows how fast, so we don't know how fast the charcoal's moving through a person based on their intestinal movement speeds. We don't know when the bile dump is happening, so it's really something that somebody would have to experiment with. You could experiment with doing it. One of the things we do for like, if, if you're going to go out and eat something, you know you shouldn't. And all of us are going to do this at some point. Am I endorsing this as a good practice? It's a good practice to do if you know you're going to cheat or stray from what you know is the proper choice. Is we do the charcoal sandwich, which is where you take some charcoal before you eat the stuff, and then you take some charcoal after you eat the stuff. And then we know that either the food is likely to catch up with the charcoal in front of it, or the charcoal behind the food is likely to catch up with it and you're going to get charcoal in that food to soak up what you probably shouldn't have been eating, but you chose to anyway. So that's the charcoal sandwich. Now, when to time charcoal on a sauna, I have, that's, I think that's completely individual and I can't, I, I can't tell you that. I don't know the answer. So you could try it. If you know you have bile dump symptoms, what are bile dump symptoms? Well, let's say somebody goes and they do the sauna and they feel kind of wrecked afterwards. They feel tired. They feel hot. They feel like brain fog. They feel like they just, they don't feel good. They feel worse after the sauna than they did before it. Well, they could start by working backwards. They could, as soon as they feel bad, they could drop some charcoal, see if the charcoal catches because we know it's we know it's there. We know it's leaking into the system. They could take the charcoal when it happens. If that didn't work, they could take the charcoal when they start the sauna. See if that catches it. They could take the charcoal as soon as they were done with the sauna. They could take the charcoal while they're in the sauna. Um, any of those might potentially work, but it it does take some experimentation. A, a quick example of, of how I work with this. I, I've told this story before. I had a, a, a father, actually my, my divorce lawyer's son, um, had issues with vomiting in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. He was already on three medications from a gastroenterologist. Didn't do anything. So I talked to him and I said, you're going to take some charcoal you're going to have to figure out which time works for it. I said, you got, you got a couple of options. He, I said, how long does it take you from when you wake up to the time you vomit? And he was vomiting like yellow, just bile. He was vomiting bile. It was a big bile dump. It went back up into his stomach. His stomach said, I don't want this crap here. Let's get rid of it. So he would vomit. He said, from the time I wake up to the time I throw up is about five minutes. I said, okay, well, the first thing you can try to do, you know, maybe put about a teaspoon of charcoal in a glass of water, keep it on your nightstand. As soon as you wake up, stir it up, drink it up, see if that aborts the vomit. And then I said, if that doesn't work, or I said, or actually I may have given him the first thing to try. The first thing to try would have been take a glass of charcoal water before bed. See if that aborts it. If it does, great. Then you don't have to do anything in the middle of the night. Then the next step would have been, as soon as you wake up, you've got that charcoal water on the nightstand, slam it, you know, stir it up, slam it, see if that aborts it. Okay. Then the last option, this is the most inconvenient option, was you have that, um, that glass of charcoal water on your nightstand. You know, I asked him, when do you usually wake up? He's like, it's almost always like 3 a.m., like really close to 3 a.m. I said, okay. If those other two approaches don't work, you're going to set an alarm for 2.30. You're going to wake up at 2.30. You're going to stir that charcoal water up. You're going to slam it down, then try to go back to sleep. And if that, that will probably work for sure. And I actually did not 
the the kid didn't need to come back and talk to me after that. I, I texted his dad. I was like, how's he doing? He's like, problem solved. I think I texted him a week later. He's like, it, it's, it's over. It's not happening anymore. Um, because of the, and I said, because of the charcoal. And he said, yeah. So I don't know the timing that works. You have to experiment with it. Um, nicotinic acid is just, the idea is that you are flushing your, okay. So the flush, it is said lasts anywhere from an hour to two hours. The idea with the sauna is you want to be flushing while you're in the sauna. So the timing of that is kind of up to you, but the way they did in that Gulf war study was take the niacin 20 to 30 minutes of cardio sauna after that. But again, these guys had nothing, but I think they were, I'm going to guess that these guys were on like disability and they were probably just living on, you know, government money, which is <laughs> if anybody should be ever should, should be able to live on government money. It's, it's veterans, <laughs> not uh, illegal entry people into the country. But anyway, that's a whole nother discussion that we're not going to have here. So yeah, the, the niacin is just like I did it this morning. I'm, I'm probably going to do another flush when I go to work out this afternoon. Because I want to be flushing when I work out. Now I will tell you this, this is important because some people have gotten a little confused because they say, well, some people are taking nicotinic acid and they say it makes them really tired. And then they, then they get over it. Well, nicotinic acid is detoxing you, actively detoxing you, pulling toxins out of your body fat and then sending them into your bloodstream. So yeah, you might feel a little tired. Okay. I've actually noticed that if like, if I wanted to have like the highest output workout that I could have taking nicotinic acid before that workout is not a good idea, but am I after winning some power lifting event or winning some, you know, running event or anything like that. No, I'm not after that. I'm after health. The exercise facilitates the detox that the niacin does. So I do the niacin before I exercise so I can get that benefit because I, I'm not trying to compete with anybody in the gym. I just want to be healthy. So that's, what, I mean, I, I just take it, I'll take it here, you know, at the house and then maybe I'll get to the gym 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, 45 minutes later. I may still be flushing. I may not, I don't stress about it, but I try to do it. You know, that that's when like, I'm going to do a strength workout. I'll take the niacin here and then I'll just go to the gym. If I'm going to do like what I call detox gym, which is the, the cardio and maybe the steam room and the sauna, then I'll bring it with me, drink it in the parking lot. So that's how I do it. I do think I have, I, I believe that I have been, I was very, very toxic. And since I started in the months, since I've started the nicotinic acid, and especially since I started doing what I call my detox gym, um, a couple weeks ago, I really turned a corner in terms of, I used to get a really stiff back and I'd have like my bile dump symptoms in the morning. And for those of you who, some of you don't understand, you say, what are bile dump symptoms? Well, a lot of times it's, if you wake up early at night, like 3 AM, 4 AM, and you have symptoms, then those are often your bile dump symptoms. Or if all of a sudden in the middle of the day, sometimes like, especially in the afternoon, you just start feeling tired and just off. And you're like, something's not right. That's your bile dump symptoms. So mine, I would wake up three ish AM and then I'd sneeze a couple times. I get this tingle in my nose and I'd sneeze a couple times and my low back would be super stiff because that's the bile hitting the kidneys. What else did I have? Well, I definitely have to wake up to pee. Oh, I would wake up feeling warm and my brain would be running. My brain would find something to run about. That has almost all, so I turned some corner where I'm not, I'm the, the back stiffness is like 50% better. The nose tingling has stopped. 
So basically the sneezing has stopped and it's just something happened. I do think I, because the, the detox gym facilitated that, I think that's really what drove it. So I do like, but again, you can really kick your ass with this stuff. You can, you know, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. So if you decide to go in the first day and you're like, I'm going to take more niacin and I'm going to go and do hard cardio. And then I'm going to get in the steam room and the sauna, just like Dr. Smith said. Oh, and then I'll do the tanning bed. I'll just do what Dr. Smith did because he said it worked for him. You are not, this is just imagine at a karate class, you have a new white belt who's never done it before. And then they want to go and do the black belt training. You are going to destroy yourself. You walk into the gym. You've never lifted weights before. And you see what the strongest guy in the gym is squatting. And you're like, I'm going to go squat that. You're going to get destroyed. You're not ready for it. You may be. Maybe you try starting slow and you go, oh, this is all right. And you try going up and you're like, this is all right. Okay, I'm still going up. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. And then all of a sudden you're like, wham, and it hits you. And you're like, oh, this is what Dr. Smith meant about kicking my own ass. Well, then what do you do? You back off. Does it make sense? You hit the wall. You hit your threshold, your tolerance. Don't keep banging. Your, do not keep banging your head into the wall and then wondering why it still hurts. That would be the definition of insanity. If you find the wall, back off. Over time, the wall will move. You'll get more tolerance. Your threshold will change. Pushing into the wall doesn't make your threshold change any faster, and it just makes you feel worse. So, yeah, I don't have timing on these things. It's just general things. But the old, the old approach was, you know, the the Gulf War study, the Scientology thing was drop the niacin, do your cardio, then do the steam room. Some days if I don't feel, there's some days where I don't feel like doing the cardio because I've already worked out a bunch and I'll just skip it. I think I did this last week. I just did the the niacin and I did this, the, actually one day I just did the steam room for like 20 minutes and then I was like, I, I feel like going home. So I didn't do all of it. And I still felt a little bit like my butt was kicked, but, but it was a, a workout week that I had done more than I have in a long time. Actually made it into the gym five times that week and I started training hard. Um, yeah. So, oh, thank you, Will, for the super chat. Will says, appreciate your work. You're on fire. Thanks for breaking the illusion for us. I'm doing my best. You, we, we're all here trying to figure this crap out together. Um, so... Let's see. I think that's all. Oh yeah. Zen dog breath said no wall for me. I am extremely moderate. This okay. Zen dog breath was suffering badly for a long time. And in, in his early days, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said many, many times in the network, but in the early days he was really sensitive and he would hit his walls a lot because you don't know where the wall is until you, you hit it. Right? Just like the child doesn't trust you that the stove is hot until oftentimes they touch the stove themselves. And he, he just said he's very sensitive. So if you're the more sensitive you are, folks, the more you know you react to these things, the slower you should go, the more you only need to do one change at a time. And that might be one change in a week. At least give it three days. At least new changes, supplements, sauna, whatever. Give it at least three days, if not one week. If the more sensitive you are, the longer you need to wait to see if that's a problem for you, because sometimes the problems creep up. What I think happens on that is I think you just slowly build up a little more bile in your blood that you're not clearing. And so like day one is just like, think of it as like, 5% worse, which you may not notice. Day two is 10% worse. Maybe you start going, eh, I don't feel so great. Maybe day three is 15%. You're going, wait, something's not right here. And finally, by the end of the week, you go, oh, crap. 
something's wrong. I'm telling you that's why you give it a week. So you have the time to recognize it if you're one of these slow buildup people. Most people notice it within one to three days. Most people, not all, but most. We do the week. So if you're one of those slow people, and not, not that slow is not bad here. It's just, this is the way it is. Then you have time to recognize it and not think, well, I added this supplement a week ago. It can't possibly be that. Famous last words. I'll just keep taking it. This is, this is why if you've ever seen the lactoferrin instructions, they are so slow. Because la- I call it the lactoferrin creep or the lactoferrin cold, which is where these things just slowly creep up on you. And then people come to me and they're like, I'm like, are you on lactoferrin? They're, they're having some issues. And I'm, and I'm like, stop the lactoferrin or take a break. See if it goes away and it will clear up. It's not that the lactoferrin was too bad for them. It's just that it was pushing them too hard, but just a little bit too much, too hard each day was building up on them. Do I know, do I know that this is exactly what's happening? No, I don't have blood tests on bile acids creeping up or vitamin A or any of that stuff. I don't, but we, we have concepts. I will create concepts so that people can, what, for what I think is probably happening so that people can understand the, what they should and shouldn't do and why these things take a while to show up sometimes. So let's see. Okay. So we got about five minutes left. If you have any super chats, get them in now. Um, cause then I go, I got to go do my inner circle, which is the, my inner circle we do after this private Q and a inside the love your liver network. Yes. There's a fee for it. Yes. You can do the advanced detox network, which is where you get to see the inner circle videos a month later. You don't get to ask questions, but you get to see these two hour more Q and A's from me every week. Yeah, if you didn't know that, I normally I normally am doing live Q and A anywhere from four to six hours in a row. So apparently, my brain is functioning pretty well without much vitamin A and copper and all this stuff. So now they're selling those copper water bottles. Oh my gosh! I had a copper water cup for a little while. Um. It never fixed me. Neither did my copper bracelet. Neither did my copper thing to, they made a copper thing to rub inside your nose. There's, it's a giant chunk of copper and you would rub it inside your nose to hopefully shut down being sick. If you did it right when you were supposedly getting sick, rubbing metal copper on the inside of your nostrils, you wouldn't get sick. You shut down your bile dumping is what you did. That's all you did. I need to go look at that. I need to go look at copper and see if it, I know it, it, um, oh, somebody, I forget some, oh, Nate, I think it was Nate, um, Allen. He was doing some research on iodine and he found that high dose iodine caused fatty liver. Let me go find that. Let me go find that study. So since, um, I don't think we have any more super chats. So, um, Joe, you don't need to show it yet. Let me go find it. Let's see. Yeah, he sent me he sent me a screenshot and uh copy clean link. Let me get in here. Wait, this is yeah. Fun Joe, still waiting. I got two papers to get here. Okay. Joe, you can show it now. So let me get back on. Yeah. So for everybody out there shoving iodine down their cake hole, um, iodine excess induces hepatic steatosis, fatty liver, through disturbance of thyroid hormone metabolism, 
involving oxidative stress in BALB mice. Iodine excess causes fatty liver. Something that causes fatty liver generally means that it is stopping bile production and dumping. So your liver is being forced to store all these fatty related compounds and it makes more fat to store these compounds. Iodine, high dose iodine ruins your thyroid, which is exactly what they're saying here. Potassium iodide particularly ruins your thyroid. I've been over that in a whole video. Let me see this other one. Um, this was another one he sent me. <laughs> Three methyl adenine alleviates excessive iodine induced, excessive iodine induced cognitive impairment. I've got brain fog. Gosh, I think it might be from the high dose iodine you take ruining your thyroid. Um, so yeah. So anyway, we did get one more super chat. So let me get to that. And then we're going to wrap it up here so I can be to my inner circle sort of on time today, instead of doing a marathon <laughs> four hours live stream here again today. So let Joe, you can go back to me and we'll do that super chat. Um, so Yaxon, I hope I said that right. Dealing with yellow and green feces after a COVID infection from over a year ago, did a feces analysis which showed bile acid malabsorption. Thoughts? Okay. You have a lot of bile in your poop. That's so they'll say it's bile acid malabsorption. Okay. Now, this is the last super chat. So don't send any more super chats today. If you do, I'll just move them to next week. And remember, if anybody ever posted a super chat here and I didn't get to it, I'm very sorry. Just send send a note to um, the, on the website. There's a contact form. Just send it to us and we'll double check on it and we'll make sure that I get to that question. Okay. So bile acid malabsorption, what they, what they mean when they say bile acid malabsorption is they're really just saying you have a lot of bile in your poop. Okay. Normally, it is expected on a standard American diet to reabsorb 95% of your bile and send it right back to the liver. So the liver can do extra work because that's really all it is. It's just extra work for the liver to redo, the, to re-clean the bile that it already tried to get rid of. Your intestines absorb practically everything that touches them for better or worse. This is very, very important. Same with your skin. <laughs> I see your super chat, John. Thank you. How dare you, right? Hashtag, how dare you stop taking super chats? Yes. How dare I do anything out here? Um, John's a, John's a comedian. Um, so anyway, you have a lot of bile in your poop. So let's go over how you can get too much bile in your poop. So I've been over before. I'm not going to pull up the study today, but there is a paper that showed when people were when they looked at constipated people, they looked at whatever they called normal pooping people. I think conventional medicine has, has accepted constipation as normal these days so much that I can't remember. It's either, I think they said if you poop once every three days, or are they even up to like five days? You're okay. If you poop once every three to five days, I think conventional medicine doesn't consider that constipation. Unreal. Like they don't want you to be healthy at all. You should be pooping absolute minimum once a day. If you had really, 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 truly healthy bowels, you'd be pooping once for each significant meal you ate. You don't have to like what I'm saying because you may think I'm judging you because you're not pooping very well, but that's how it's supposed to be. That's how babies poop. If you eat a meal, just think it should move through you. Now, I'm not going to do all the intestinal stuff, but one meal should move through you and come out the other end before the next meal on the conveyor belt. Do you understand? It's like a conveyor belt. That's how it should be. You eat a big meal, it moves out as a poop. You eat another meal, it moves out as a poop. That's how it's supposed to work. You may not be pooping well. So is everybody else. I mean, I will say that 
generally some mornings I'll some some more some days before noon I'll poop three times and I, I'm not talking loose bowels. How long have I been doing this? Five and a half years. I will tell you, men tend to have less issues with constipation than women because men make more bile. And how does that work in terms of pooping? Bile in your intestines is what triggers the pooping movement. Okay. So the study was done. Uh, these are rough numbers. But what they found was normal pooping people, whatever that meant for the paper, I didn't look that up, but normal pooping people in their poop was about 500, I forget the units, so we're just going to say units. There was about 500 units of bile in their poop. Ish. Okay? <laughs> Ish. <laughs> Constipated people had about 200 units of bile in their ish. Diarrhea people had about 1,200 units of bile in their ish. Okay? Wow, weird. So the people with tons of bile in their poop were pooping faster and watery, almost like their body was desperate to get rid of it because it was irritating everything it touched. Okay? Okay? constipation didn't have the trigger to poop because there wasn't enough bile touching the intestine. So it didn't move as fast as it should have. Simple as that. So constipation can be caused one of the ideas. So if people are making bile, well, first of all, a lot of people might be, Oh, I don't know, ruining their thyroid function by doing things like, Oh, I don't know, excess iodine poisoning themselves with vitamin A and copper and all these other things that slow down and stop or, re or I won't use the R word, um, even though I'd be using it in a scientific context, context here, but they do things that slow down their bile production and their bile dumping. So that bile is not being dumped. So then they get constipated. Okay. Or they may have done things that cause them to get what's called intrahepatic cholestasis. So intra from within hepatic liver cholestasis basically means bile stagnation, but it can all, it also just means bile leaking and going into places it's not supposed to be. So what that means is the liver makes the bile and directly from the liver, it's leaking into the bloodstream. So does that bile make it to the intestines to trigger pooping? No, it's going around in your blood, causing you to feel bad. And that's why you have chronic health issues. If you want to see the background on all this stuff, go see live streams, either number 53 or live stream number 71 on this channel. So if you type in like love your liver live stream 71 in the search box, you'll probably find it. But you should probably put all those, all those words like love your liver live stream. That's how I start. If you go on a search, my live streams, every single live stream starts with love your liver live stream. So type that in, and then if you want to search for a term, type that term after love your liver live stream. That's probably the best way to search because YouTube's search engine is not very good. Aaron, you're saying, so I wonder why Dr. Smith is always flushing. I mean, I, I enjoy it <laughs> and I've been getting better. So I, if the flesh ne doesn't necessarily always go away, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this sometime, maybe in the network about, I still want to have some amount of flesh. And we have a theory, a bell curve theory of the flesh and Kelsey and I have talked about that. So, um, where were we? Oh, the diarrhea. Well, if, if you, if so yellow and green bile. Okay. So let's talk about this. Yellow bile is gen Oh, well, let me back up to green bile. In the research, it has been said that bile will turn green if it, they use the term matures in the gallbladder long enough. So bile is normally yellow. You also see it as orange. For those of you who have done the Love Your Liver program long enough, you'll see orange poop. You're welcome to say if you've seen it because I've seen it plenty of times. But you might have yellowish poop. You might have orangish poop. You could also have green poop. Okay. So green poop. There are people out there, not myself, claiming that green poop 
means you're dumping a bunch of copper. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this only because the analysis has never been done. I haven't done the analysis. I don't, I don't get green poops anymore. But some people will say, this is, you know, simple color theory here, right? Yellow plus blue makes green. Well, bile is yellow. Vitamin A is yellow. Well, vitamin A can be yellow or orange or red. So yellow plus blue, well, what color is oxidized copper? It's that turquoise blue, right? Kind of greenish blue. So if you mixed yellow and blue together, you might get green. And some people really want to believe that they're detoxing tons of copper in their bile. I don't know that this is true. What I do know is that the research says that bile that has sat in the gallbladder long enough turns green. So that's what I go by. I don't say anything about more copper in green poops. There's bile in a green poop. You have a yellow poop. There's bile and vitamin A in there. You have an orange poop. There's bile and vitamin A in there. What does green poop mean? I don't know that it means anything other than it sat in your gallbladder for a while. And that's just me saying what I've seen in the research. The copper theory is something I theorized once and other people kind of ran with it. And I said, I, I don't know that this is true. It's just a theory. It's just color theory, right? So... Um, so Yaxon is saying, so what do I think happened after the, after COVID that the feces color changed from yellow and green? I'm guessing you don't consider that optimal either. No. Well, okay. So if we wanted to talk about bile acid malabsorption, okay, well, let me talk about the two ways that you get too much bile in your intestines. One. You just dump it from the liver. It's supposed to go into the intestines. So you, your liver makes the bile. It goes into your common bile duct. And then it's supposed to go into your small intestine. Then it comes out the other end. That's the normal way. Now, you can also, this is in a paper I've been over before. You have to have, okay, so that your intestines have tons of blood flow going to them. This is really important to know. So there's, there's the enterohepatic circulation, which is the blood vessels from your intestines when they absorb stuff like nutrition or toxicity. So they absorb stuff from your intestines. It goes into the portal vein. So it goes into a big vein that goes right up into your liver. I went over this in the inner circle last week. The portal vein going to your liver. Think of it as like this is the best analogy I can do that people usually understand. Think of it as like a nightclub. Like your intestines are absorbing nutrients, toxins, whatever. Good people, bad people, all trying to get into the nightclub. You, why does the nightclub have one door in? So that the bouncer can say, you're cool, you're not cool. You've paid, you haven't paid. You can come in and enjoy you didn't fit the dress code, you can leave. Okay, sorry if this is triggering anybody who couldn't get into the nightclub, sorry. Um, not a lot of good things happen in those things. <laughs> anyway, so, so your liver is the bouncer. So your intestines are saying everything's going to go to the portal vein that goes right to the liver. The liver is the bouncer deciding where to send people. That's your security. Your intestines don't have security. Your intestines are letting everybody in. The bouncer is who says where they, can they come in or where do they go? Are they going to get kicked into the bile to be pooped out? Okay. So that entero means from the gut to the liver circulation. Now think about this gut. If you're absorbing things and it goes to the liver and then your liver turns that toxic bile and whatever else came into it and turns it into bile again and it goes into the guts and then your guts absorb it again and then it goes back to the liver. Do you see how this is a loop? Enterohepatic circulation. That's why they call it like it's like its own loop. It's like a closed loop. It's supposed to be. Then this is the important thing. Your intestines themselves have their own blood flow 
to keep them alive. Okay. So just like, you know, the oxygenated blood from your heart goes to the intestines, they have to have their oxygenated blood flow and then they take their oxygen, right? And that goes back and goes to the heart and the lungs to be re-oxygenated. Just think of that loop. So, and then, then those, that same blood vessels are feeding your intestines, the nutrients that they need and taking away the toxins, the waste toxins of those cells. So your, your intestines have like two separate blood flows. There's the absorption stuff for better or worse that goes to the liver. And that's a loop, the enterohepatic circulation. Then there's the, the, the blood vessels feeding your intestines and taking away waste. So intestines are full of blood vessels. Okay. What does this mean? I've, I've actually shown the paper before where the blood vessels that feed the intestines, let's say you have a lot of bile in your blood from cholestasis, toxic bile theory. You have a lot of bile in your blood. It's coming to the intestines. Let's say that the intestines are being fed way too much toxic bile in the blood that's supposed to be nourishing them. Well, what do those cells do? Well, one of the things they can do is they could detox into the gut. So the very blood flow that is coming to the intestines to nourish the intestines could actually be feeding it bile that then goes into the intestines themselves. And then that could increase the bile in the intestines, which could then cause diarrhea and, and too much bile in the poop, which we would call bile acid malabsorption. Now, next thing would be bile is the cause of leaky gut. Toxic bile is what is eating away at your gut, causing leaky gut. I've shown this research before. Leaky gut, obviously, if you're damaging the gut, it's not going to be, as, it, it could be one of two things. It could be absorbing way too many things, right? It's leaky. So things could penetrate better but it also may not be absorbing certain things as well. The bile is the root cause of gut problems itself, burning the intestines as it goes through. We've been over the retinoic acid and the, the chemical peel and all that stuff before. So I'm going to save that. So if somebody, you know, one of the, one of the reasons it's thought that, that this was I hypothesized, I think by David Hagerston is one of the reasons we do reabsorb bile is because if we didn't reabsorb bile on its way through, it would cause so much damage to our intestines that it would, it would just ruin our intestinal tract entirely. So we actually reabsorb it to move it around. So it doesn't, I mean, think, think if you were not pooping for three days, how much damage would just bile sitting in your intestines, if your intestines didn't absorb it, it would just be eating away at your intestines the whole time. So you have to think of why does the body do this? Maybe it's a protective mechanism. It's not because the body wants it. It's because that if it just sat in there. So what is COVID? What is COOF as I call it? It is a massive prolonged. What is the flu? What are colds? Massive, prolonged, short-term, giant dump of toxic bile that is leaking into your system that is causing all of your symptoms. Whatever triggered it, it, it may just be one dump. could just be one dump that happens. And it dumps enough into your system that it takes your liver days to clean up the mess. I've talked about this before in, in relationship and analogy to a flood. So the dumping of the bile, the giant dump, which may, I, I don't know how long the dump lasts. Nobody studied that because nobody seems to want to believe their, their internal toxicity is what causes their health problems. So however long the dump lasts, once it stops, your body starts cleaning up. Think of that like a flood, like, the dumping is when the rain, let's say it's, it's rains causing the floods, huge rains are happening and the floods, the flash floods, all that stuff are happening. The floods cause tons of damage during it. So that's why like during the coof, if, if we 
believe what they told us, there were people dying from the flood of bile in their system. And this also makes sense that as they had more comorbidities or more diseases, they had less of a chance of living. Well, the more diseases a person has, to me, would mean the more toxicity they have and the more bile they were already leaking because that's why they have all these diseases. So if all of a sudden they have a trigger of a massive bile dump, they're the ones most at risk because they're already, they've already got flood damage. They're leaking all over the place. But so, so remember after the flood, after the flood happens and the rain stop and the sky clears, the damage is there. The damage has been done and then it's going to take weeks, months, years to fix the damage that has happened because that toxic bile eats holes in everything it touches. The more toxic it is, the more holes it eats away. So, and, and what often goes with colds? Well, there's often loose bowels. There's often vomiting. The, the body's trying to get rid of it. The, you, you may stink like you may, you got stuff coming out of your nose. You got stuff coming out of your eyes. You got stuff coming out of your ears. You got stuff coming out of everywhere. You got colored things coming out of your lungs. Wow. One of the things people cough up a lot when they're sick is yellowish and tannish and off white colors. Even green. Gosh, what colors bile sometimes? Oh, it's green. I, I don't believe the whole, like every, I don't, I don't necessarily go by the whole, like, oh, if you have colored phlegm, you have an infection because when I've had colds, the very last stage of a cold for me, I don't get them anymore, but the very last stage, I, I remember this very clearly from when I used to get them, was the last stages would be when I would cough up colored phlegm. But I was getting better. So did I all of a sudden have an infection? No, I didn't have an infection. I'm clearing out the garbage bile that was dumped and was deposited everywhere. One of the places was my lungs. Okay, Yaxon. Well, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. What's my opinion then on cholestyramine or cholestopol if the yellow feces never stops? We use activated charcoal, which has okay, activated charcoal, Zen principle is the brand I like. Not principle like a school principle, but principle like principles, as in L E S at the end instead of A L S at the end. Um, Zen principle, powdered charcoal. Go and look up the side effects for cholestyramine. Crazy list of side effects. It's a bile acid sequestrant, as in it binds to bile acids. Well, I can tell you that in studies that have compared activated charcoal to cholestyramine, the effects of activated charcoal were just as good as cholestyramine. And activated charcoal, the only side effects that people tend to get from activated charcoal would be constipation if they take more than they're able to tolerate. People who have taken mega, mega, mega doses of charcoal have gotten like a mega colon where they got a blockage in their colon because they took absolutely stupid amounts of it. We're not advocating that here. I have, I have a 15 article section in the love your liver program on charcoal debunking it and going over how to figure out your dosing and all that stuff. So if you're pooping, okay. So you said you're talking about years at this point, diet is good and you're pooping two to three times a day. So what I would say is charcoal would be, I mean, we have, I don't know if she's here today, but we had one woman who had had ulcerative colitis for years and she got in the love your liver program and she was doing the, the charcoal and other stuff. As I suggested, she did do a couple of consults with me. She doesn't have ulcerative colitis anymore. Did I cure it? I didn't, I didn't cure it. She did the work. Here, let me get the link. Joe put up the link to Zen Principle. You can find it. Uh, you can order it direct from them. Or you can go to Amazon has it if you're into that. So, but basically what you what you got, Yaxan, is it, whatever the COOF did to your liver and bile system, if, if you're having normal, okay, if you're having normal poops, they're just... Maybe they're tending to be soft. Maybe they're then they're they're maybe yellowish or orangish or greenish. This is not something we worry about in the program. We tend to be happy that that's happening. I very regularly have soft, orangish poops. So 
am I worried about? If you, if you were saying you were having loose bowels all the time, then I would be binding that up with charcoal. That's one of the first things that I would do. If, if people are having loose bowels, the first thing we do is activated charcoal. One of the next things that I, I have them consider is a probiotic, a special probiotic called lactospore. Um, so those would, and then I'd make sure that they were getting some soluble fiber to help bind it up as they tolerated it from various food sources or supplement sources. So, um, yeah, here's, there's, there's a weird thing. And I want, I want to hear from anybody in the program who's been doing charcoal a long time. This is a very interesting phenomenon that I've noticed in myself. Those of you who have been doing this detox a long time, and maybe you've done charcoal a lot. Have you ever noticed that as you take charcoal, the longer you take it, the less you see it in your poop. Cause I can sometimes now take charcoal and I don't see it in my poop at all. And I'm wondering where the heck did it go? Because I used to take charcoal and it was, you know, poops were black and now I take it and they're not black. I'm going where, uh, where did it disappear to? Cause it should be there, and I don't think we digest it. So, Hedwood asks, does lactospore help at all with bile production? I don't know. It's affecting bile. It's either affecting the... So, remember the two things The two things that... that well, what, what a probiotic can do is... Or our good bacteria, if you want to call it that. Well, there's research, I've been over the research on lactospore before where it can really help with, they, they actually found the, the two things that it was really helping with were severe depression and diarrhea. There's actually studies specifically with those two symptoms in people. Well, which we would associate with tons of bile coming out. Some of it's leaking into the system. That's the severe depression. And then some of it's getting into the bowels and that's the diarrhea. So... But lactospore is just something to, uh, to try. I would like with probiotics, it's, you, you try something and you see, and if it doesn't help within two weeks, stop taking it. If it makes you feel worse, you could see, you can give it a little longer to see if that's just a cleaning out of your guts. And if it continues to feel bad, then stop taking it. But if you feel better, if you notice the, if you start out and a probiotic makes you feel not so good and you see those symptoms as you take it longer going down and you see the benefits going up, then you can keep taking that. But if you take a probiotic and things just feel worse, then don't keep taking it. I don't care what anybody says. And I don't like big mixed probiotics. We tend to experiment with either a bifido or a lactobacillus. And then the lactospore is a separate thing to try. So, um, let's see. Oh, Will's got to go. Um, let's see. I think, I, th I, th I hope that answers it. I mean, Yaxon, that the, the thing that I would generally say would be to get into the love your liver program. And then you can ask people there for help. I mean, you can always work with me or Nathan. Um, I'm, I've got two practitioners in training right now in, in terms of hope Tipton and Kelsey, um, Kenny, and they'll hopefully be We'll be, we'll be unleashing them to see clients soon enough. And yeah, it's very exciting. Um, we did, uh, our new shipment of magnesium lotion. I got to go pick it up from the FedEx place today. And the lactoferrin will be available to the general public this coming Monday. So that I think that's the, I think that's April fool's day. I think that's April 1st, also Easter at the same time. So anyway, or is, I don't, I don't remember. I'm, I may, I get dates screwed up all the time. I tell people it's not safe to leave me with my own schedule. Um, everybody has their weaknesses. Me scheduling things on a calendar is one of mine. So anyway, oh, we're without hope today. Yes. Yes. Hope's usually in the comments helping a lot. So, okay. So I got to go do the inner circle folks. Hope you all enjoyed it today. A little shorter than usual, but, uh, I will see you all next week. Hope you got something useful out of it. Bye now.